Hi, everybody. It's Lisa Murray here. Hi, my sweet lifers. Today on our Martini Talk show, I've got my good friend Christian Montone. He has a beautiful book that he has illustrated and written called The Place in My Head. Um, he has been so wonderful to share this with me. I've read it. It's just lovely, Christian. It's lovely. I love the illustrations. Guys, take a peek. They're just so full of color and so fantastic, imaginative. Let's see. There you go. So share with me how this book came about and, and all the details around that. Okay, be happy to. First of all, thanks for having me here, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Very, very glad to be here with you and to chat and to talk about this process. The way this project came to me was through a former student who was attending Rutgers University. I teach high school art. I'm about to enter my 22nd year in the art department where I work. And a number of years ago, a student by the name of Louis or Louis Catazone, as he's known professionally, Louis Catazone reached out to me while he was in college and said, I have this story that I wrote. It's a story poem. Can I show it to you? So he would drive over to my place. We had a series of meetings and we developed the character. I sketched out the characters right in front of him both the animal characters and the human character whom we called the kid. He has no name in the book. Right. I based it roughly on what I thought like an eight to 10 year old would look like. Okay. And he gave me some guidance on it. So long story, very short, the project was completed. I finished doing the illustrations after 17 months. It took a lot of development. Um, it was a labor of love, but very work intensive as these things are. Right. So we, we shopped it around to a number of places. Um, we shopped it around to a number of agents, couldn't get arrested. And, um, it's very important for viewers and, and prospective authors and illustrators to know you don't give up. Right. So the project sat on a shelf, or I should say in a portfolio and in a hard drive. Where they and, often always do for like years, yeah, screenplays, yeah. you know this happen all the time. Yeah. yeah. So what ended up happening was because Lewis is a very busy entrepreneur mm -hmm. and has a number of things going on, he decided to leave the project. And I said to him, what if I rewrite the story? I keep your original story but I rewrite the verbiage of it. Right. And he gave me permission and I did that. And if you look, there's a story credit in the book right. for, for Lewis. So I rewrote the book, kept the original title, obviously kept the original illustrations. Right. And I casually mentioned to a friend of mine who works with Dino Price, I said, would Dino maybe be interested in looking at this project? Now, this was after I had rewritten it and it was sitting on a shelf for a while. Dino liked it and he said, let's do it. And um, when I delivered the final digital product of the book and he and I were going over the specs for it, he said to me, have you got another book for me? And I said, as a matter of fact, I do. So I gave him what we called, you know, the elevator pitch, a very quick elevator pitch. And he said, that's fantastic. So for the last little while, I've been working on this next book. Right. But the way this first book came together was really, really great because I'd studied illustration. I went to Parsons School of Design in Manhattan. I majored in illustration, did not intend to become an art educator, but I began working in the admissions department right after graduation. People kept saying, you're going to be a great teacher. I continued to do fine art and illustration all these years. I, I right. do them all these years. Right. But then I started teaching summer programs and Saturday classes, and then I became a full-time high school art teacher. I got bullied into it. Um, and sometimes the things that we resist in our lives and in our careers, yeah. when you have a number of people you really trust telling you, you'd be really good at this, this would be good for you, hands up, yeah you'd be really good at this one. It's people you trust, right? You have to listen to them. And I mean, I think that's part of the sweet life, if you will, yeah. is 
listening to those trusted voices. So, you know, many years into my career, I, my teaching career, I've continued to do fine art and illustration. But what's interesting is there was a gap of time where I wasn't doing anything illustrative. I was only making fine art pieces. And people keep saying, you should illustrate, you should illustrate, you should illustrate, you should illustrate. And I kept getting this here and there. Do you want to work on this? Do you want to work on that? No. And I'm really grateful to Louis or Louis um, because it was really, really his impetus that brought the project to life. He says I carried it over the finish line. Um, but I am grateful to him because of the story that he shared with me. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to happy to um, have him always be a part of this narrative in this project. And you know, um, he followed what he needed to follow too, in, in terms of his career. So, um, what I, I'd like to do is to put a little Easter egg or two in in the next book. There's going to be room for a lot of little Easter eggs where you have a little ref, a lot of references to things. There's going to be a, a cool reference to uh, Lewis in the next book too. That's awesome. And the kid, the kid from this book, even That's though this the next book is not a continuation or a sequel in any way. Kind of like how sometimes George Lucas or Steven Spielberg will put like a reference from one of their earlier movies in a later film, or they'll they'll do each other's little references in there. I'm going to have to shout out Lewis in this one. Yeah. Well, I'm so impressed with all of it. It is just so beautiful. It's a beautiful story about a little boy who goes to all these different places when he dreams. And, you know, so often for me, for those of my watchers, you know, I talk about the Holy Spirit and also talk about listening to the voices like we talked about, you referenced earlier. And, and yeah. you know, oftentimes yeah. in my life, all through childhood, where I have gotten my guidance has been in a lot of dreams. And so this book was just really cool because it resonated to me where yeah. a lot of my clarity and kind of the confusion of the, the awake world sometimes gets fixed in the sleeping yeah. world yeah you can also look at what you just called the awake world as another version of a greater awakening because sometimes the universe in your head or the place in your head right. is another awake world and it's it's through our actions that we awaken it um a very interesting thing is that in working on my next book, I had seven eighths of it written in my head. And I had, I looked at it as a big circle. I call it the conceptual circle. And I think a lot of authors do this. You get everything you wanna to put together and you draw what I call a conceptual circle around it. And then that can be broken into wedges. This is just how I visualize it, like pieces of a pie or like the game Trivial Pursuit where you put the wedges in. I had seven eighths. I had one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. I was missing seven. I was missing that, what I call the seventh wedge that brings us from the climax of activity to a nice ending. Right. And I did what I normally do. I just went for a walk in my local park. Um, I, I'm happy to live a 10 minute walk away from a very large park with many beautiful trails and, you know, open spaces as well. Um, and one afternoon, thinking about absolutely nothing with my head clear on a warm day, I was walking along the park. I could walk back there and pinpoint exactly where my foot had fallen when that seventh wedge, I downloaded it. That's awesome. And if you listen to a lot of authors, um, and being an author is somewhat new to me. When you listen to a lot of authors, they say they downloaded their idea, just like I sometimes download my illustrative ideas in the right. development of my, my, my next project. It hit me and I felt both knocked out and clear all at the same time. And I just said, thank you. And I made a voice memo of what this idea was. Right. And I went right home and actually the very next day I wrote out my outline. Um, the way I'm working the new book is very different than the way I, I work the place in my head. The place in my head, someone else intellectual material was brought to me. Right. With this, it's me writing the story. Um, 
yeah yeah and, and it's it's um it's been quite a ride because I just started with a, a 30 point outline and then I've added things inside those 30 points, which are now up to like a 36 point outline. Um, as many children's books are, this will be a page of writing on the left, illustration on the right, but for the next one, it won't be verse and it won't be rhyming. It's going to be prose and it's not going to be in the first person, it's going to be in the third person. It's going to be a story. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so it's exciting oh. to have this one thing out there in people's hands and, you know, having people email me and Facebook me and tweet me and Instagram me photos of their children holding the book or them holding the book. Yeah. Um, and it's nice to have that out there and to be, you know, receiving feedback on it while I'm developing the new thing, which is it's nice. And it's that, again, if enough people in your life that you really trust are telling you you're doing something right, you should believe them. Yep. And keep on trucking. <laughs> yeah. You should believe them. And, you know, I think everything has its place in time. This book wasn't supposed to come out several years ago. I think that in the midst of the pandemic, you know, because this was released in September 2020, you know, this was yeah. a really good time for this book to come out. I'm not saying that it wouldn't have been well received earlier. I'm just saying that I think that the imaginative sense of travel and fearlessness is something that adults and children could really enjoy here. And when people tell me they enjoy reading it to their children, that- speaks volumes, honestly. That inspires me to, you know, create more stories that adults will enjoy telling their children and sharing with their children, you know. Um, so talk to me about the new book. You've got I don't think that children's books. Say that one more time, please. Oh, so there's a little delay in our video. Uh, I was going to say, tell me about this new book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One thing I just wanted to one note I wanted to note quickly was um, I don't look at these children's books as children's books. I look at them as all ages books. Yeah. That's the term I, I think I would like to use for this type of literature. So the new book, um, I haven't told too many people about this yet, but I'm announcing it here online for the first time. The new book is a book about time travel. And it's about a boy named Chris, based on me, who hangs out with his imaginary friend, Timmy. I had an imaginary friend named Timmy when I was a child. And he goes to the mall with his mom and dad one day and they buy him a coloring book about New York City. And one of the pages is about Times Square. It's an older image of Times Square. He doesn't know this. Me in 1981 when I was eight years old. And a few months ago, I found the original coloring book on eBay after searching for it for years. The timing. Wow. Full circle. Yeah. So from the age of eight to 48, now 40 years, I've been collecting postcards, photographs, slides, illustrations, and any media showing the history of Times Square from 1900 to the present. And because I live in New Jersey and I used to live in Brooklyn and I used to live in Staten Island and I went to college in Manhattan, you know, I had fairly easy access to the area anytime I wanted to go see the changes. Because Times Square is really like a mood ring for the world. Whatever's happening is happening. Whatever's happening in the world is happening in Times Square whether it's triumph for tragedy, whether it's deserted or whether it's packed, whether people are celebrating or whether other things are going on. So anyway, he brings his book home to his imaginary friend. He says, you know, I really like this place. And he goes to a theater performance in a museum with his parents in the city. He sees the Times Square is not what it was in this image. 
And that actually happened in real life. And he goes home to his imaginary friend and he says, I want to go back into that photo. And they travel into the book and they time travel zigzagging through a bunch of different decades, not in order, but they zigzag through a bunch of different decades throughout Times Square. And that's how I came up with the title, The Times of the Times. So Times of the Times. So I'm um, pretty happy to, to talk about that. That's really cool. I'm excited. So I know I'm you're excited. working on illustrations and you're going to be sharing some of those on social as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see what you've got going on over there on your sketchbook. <laughs> yeah. um, I can share a little bit of the sketches right now if you would like. I'd love to see them. Yeah. Okay. So I've been putting these sketches in a folio. Now, illustrators out there, now I use sketchbooks to do my rough sketches. Um, I'm up to sketchbook number 156. Um, I was using a sketchbook, but the binding fell apart. So I just bought one of these nice folios to keep the sketches for the beginning of this project. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend these to artists, photographers, or anybody who archives their work. They're acid-free, they're really great. Little pro tip. So yeah. I mentioned that our character, Chris, goes to the mall with his mom and dad. So I did the sketch. That's lovely. Yeah. And I looked for photo reference for malls. And I'm working from photo reference of my parents and myself. So we do see my mom and dad in some of the images. That's neat. So that's one sketch. Thank you. And then, you know, from there, I, I sort of roughed out what I thought it would look like when the character was in the store. That's a rough. And then back in his bedroom, that's another rough. That's cool. Thank you. And then I developed it some more based on a store in the mall called Paper Tiger that I liked growing up and the store where I got that original coloring book. And this is a version of the cover of that coloring book. It's not exact. It's not an exact copy. And then, so these are just the sketches. They're the working pencil sketches. I'm just in the pencil phase. I have this belief that everything good starts with a pencil. Yeah. Because iPhones started with a pencil. You know, aircraft carriers start with a pencil. I mean, somebody pencils something out on a piece of paper or a napkin or with a felt pen or the marker or something. I mean, there's some people who think with a computer program and that's fine. But I think sometimes the kinesthetic process of mark making, right? I know as a visual artist, is very, very important. Um, even when I'm working on a collage of, of many images or objects that are, that are glued or, or fastened down, you move them around. In a sense, that is a sketch. And by the kinesthetic process of taking the pieces of paper and moving them around, you know. You get the feel. You do. Also, I'm sure when you work in your garden, which is really lovely, do you ever chart out on a piece of paper? Okay, I'm going to put that there and that there, and I don't want that next to that. It might be invasive. Yeah. Sometimes you just get an idea and you scribble it down. So, you know. So then here's another one of the sketches, and it's um, Chris showing Timmy the coloring book. He's very excited about it. That's cool. Again, enough. Thank you. And then He's on 42nd Street with his parents and it looks very scary. Now, one thing I wanted to note is because you know the Times Square area, especially in the 70s and 80s, had a tremendous amount of you know, adult material presence. The way I sidestep anything inappropriate for an all ages book is I have a lot of the buildings looking like they're just destitute. Okay. And where there's theater marquees, I put stuff like monster films on them. Something that was really harmless, you right. know, right, you know, to all ages, you know. This one says Banshee Apocalypse on it, you know. <laughs> so I figured you no know, one's gonna be harmed by that image. No. Um, and then, you know, I, I've already added in some Easter eggs to, you know, um, nods to some of my favorite films. This is when he's, you know, in the 1980s and Times Square is looking a little rough. So I threw in, De Niro and Jodie Foster from Taxi Driver. That's cool. And I threw in um, John Voight and Dustin Hoffman from Midnight Cowboy in there. 
as well as a few a few other characters because they do you know they're Times Square oriented types of things. Oh, yeah. He goes to an art museum and he sees Times Square like things and he starts making the connection that you know oh advertising is art Times Square is art these things are artful. And all throughout the book, there are going to be these themes of being watched. There's an eye in there that's based on the eye from um, the advertising campaign for Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Okay. I wanted to make some references to films in here. Um, and I figured that would be a good way to do it. The other, the other things that um, I have in here are, as Easter eggs are, you know, references to Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I threw in references to things of the early 80s that I loved, like when I was a kid, Debbie Harry, you know, so I have that as a poster on the wall. She and a number of other elements are watching them throughout the book. So I wanted there to be the sense that the kids are being watched over no matter what they do, whether it's by a billboard or whether it's by a sculpture, they're safe. Right they're safe. Someone might not pick that up at first. Um, I, don't in, I don't explicitly say that, but it's implied in the illustrations. Another one of my favorite films of all time is um, Valley of the Dolls. So I put a reference to the scene where Susan Hayward is doing this theater performance with this spinning mobile all around her. Mobile or mobile, I've heard yeah. it said different ways. And he and his parents are watching it that mobile, of course, is in the art museum that they visit. So it repeats. And right away, the character, the young character, starts making these connections between art and life. Oh, you know, life is artful. Life can be artful. You know, there's the mobile again. It's in the gallery. And again, he's with his mom and dad in this gallery. The eye is watching over. And in this, we even have Timmy, the imaginary friend has traveled and he's sitting up in the balcony watching over the family. That's neat. Yeah, so far, so far, um, the only people who can see Timmy, the only person who can see Timmy is Chris until right. they start time traveling. So the way that happens is, well, he goes home and he says, Timmy, you know, I'm not real thrilled with the way it looks. It doesn't look any, you know, it doesn't look anything like it does here. So Timmy says, okay, show me that postcard and then show me the book. They look at the postcard versus the book. Again, this is just a, a rough, it's right. a rough sketch. Right. And then Timmy gets an idea. Because Timmy is imaginary and lives his, in his imagination, we've already suspended disbelief. He can do anything. He can walk through walls. So he says, let's put our hands over the book and let's time travel. And so that's, into how the book. that's how they get in. That's how they get in. Like a phantom toll booth, if you will. And what is, begin, what is gonna happen is this ephemeral sort of ectoplasm spiral will engulf them. And the reference that, the visual reference that I make here or that I'm gonna be making in the color is in 2001 A Space Odyssey, when, um, the central character, Dave, goes through the time tunnel through Jupiter and everything is just color. It's just color. You don't need to be told that he's traveling. The color tells you. Right, right. The motion tells you. Right. And that's what I, I'm doing with that. So they find themselves in the 1960s in Times Square and that was my sketch for that. And then... I'm gonna leave it here. They meet a friend. They meet this nice young girl who can see both of them. That's cool. And, and she says, hey, did you guys come from a time tunnel? And they said, yeah, how did you know? And she's gonna to say to them, I can spot you time travelers anywhere. <laughs> so the, um, the styling of the, kids their clothing is kind of basic i wanted them you know to look like they were appropriate for the 80s because that's where we begin but kind of appropriate for any decade um the character of the girl who is as yet unnamed i haven't picked a name for her yet and i will she looks a little bit a little bit a little bit more stuck maybe somewhere in the 70s or 80s okay. um 
and she's going to continue to travel with them. And the three of them are going to travel as they look through all the decades. So part of the fun is going to come in when they hit the 1900s and somebody says to them, why are you children dressed so outlandishly and why aren't you in school? And the, the young girl says to this person, oh, wait, wait for 80 more years. The future's great. We all look like this. So we're going we're gonna to travel through a bunch of decades. We might see the Times Square ball draw at least on one of the, one of the nights. We very well might see um, VE Day from World War II. We might run into a sailor and a nurse who were kissing in the street. Yeah. yeah. Um, we may go to a donut shop. We may also go into the Bonds International Casino and crowd surf. We may run into a character based on James Dean as he's walking down the street, having his photo taken very iconically. So I figured this was this book is a real this next book is a really great way to get so many of the pop culture references of many decades that I love right put together in a book that has historic references but is also totally new yeah and I and the love way imagine it it's just so imaginative it's really it's really cool. And of course the illustrations are, you obviously have like I have on mine, there's a signature look to when you do your art. Yeah, I say, know. Whether it be the photography or the paintings or whatever I'm doing, they're like, oh, I know that that's an Elisa Murray. And this, this is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I can see the, the similarity in your style that's gonna be carried through to this next project, so. Thank you. It's gonna carry through, but I keep getting asked, are you gonna have dots? because the place in my head has millions of dots. When you look at everything up close, there are millions of dots. There will be no dots in this book. The color is gonna be a little bit more developed in a slightly different way. And I don't know if I'm gonna have that heavy black line or not. Okay. I was thinking maybe the challenge, the color, the creative challenge for me, other than doing the whole project, Right. And writing the whole project. I thought maybe a good creative challenge or stylistic challenge for the illustration in this would be to have it all be colored pencil, no ink. Um, because then I really have to work with subtlety mm -hmm. in a way that you sometimes don't have to when you have that heavy black line. I haven't fully decided yet, but more on that later. Um, also, the way I work illustration is very different than the way I might work a fine art drawing or a fine art painting. Um, there might be a bold graphic illustrative quality to some of that other stuff, but this just develops for its own world, you know? And um, it's nice to be, to be developing a signature. It's nice to have developed a signature and it's nice to, when you have that signature, pull the edges of it, broaden it. Right. You can still, as a visual artist, whether you're painting in acrylic, whether you're painting on bodies, whether you're painting on walls, wood, excuse me, whether you're drawing on paper or board, once you have something, you're never gonna lose it. Right. You just need to continue to develop it and make it the best it can be and challenge yourself. Now, the process of getting to this point and further is really challenging as an illustrator. What I do is I do a rough sketch, usually on a piece of loose paper, then I do, or cardstock, then I do a more developed sketch on paper. Right. Then um, sometimes I have to shift and move elements around. So I do have a tracing paper and transferring. Once I have all my comp sketches, I have to redraw the entire book over. Okay. So imagine you're a band, you've been honing your skills and playing clubs. Now you have to play arenas, but you have to do that set of songs every night, right. bigger, better, faster, maybe more developed, more solos, maybe spend a little more time with intro and outro and coda, maybe, maybe play harder or run around the stage harder, use more of the stage, engage with the audience more. That's the metaphor I use. You now, I'm going to then be playing the big game. And the big game is 
I'm going to be drawing every, every illustration, redrawing every illustration larger on white paper. I trace that, transfer it, you know, do the rubbing on the back, right. transfer that onto illustration board. Then I refine all the line on the illustration board. Then I have to color them all. And it looks like it's going to be roughly 36 illustrations. Well, and the last one, last one was 17. So this is going to be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But it's well worth it. You know, when you've got that baby finished at the end of the day and, you know, it's published, it's out there and everybody's saying, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. This is so cool. And what I love about us, both as artists, as well as authors, because we have that wonderful thing that we combine all of our doodahs, right? Um, and we live forever. We just, it's there. I just love that part about what we do as artists is that the stuff that we are giving to the universe outlives us. And um, so I'm all about creating as much cool, sweet stuff as I can while I'm here. And I love all the stuff that you're doing as well. And now they can catch this book on Amazon, right? Yes, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Right. And it's funny, funny, funny note, I was at a family party and my eight-year-old cousin said, Chris, I went and saw your book at the library. And then I went back the next day and it wasn't there anymore. Someone took it out. Oh. So apparently it's in, the, in a number of libraries as well. So yeah, the place in my head. Right. And I'm going to give you guys that are watching, I'll give you a link so that you've got how to get this in the episode notes as yeah. well as more information about you as well. Christian, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate this. And um, I'm, I'm appreciative as an artist and as a fellow spirit and as, you know, a, a fellow creator. Um, there's so much in the world right now that's just content. And I appreciate you because you point to moments, you point to art, you point to creative people, you point to people that have a purpose and it's not just content. Right. And um, I thank you for keeping that bar high. And yes. thanks for inviting me into this. Thank you for being here and my friend forever. Mm -hmm. yes. Listen, Come on. if you found any value in this, do us a favor, like and share. Don't forget to ring that bell and we'll see you soon on another Martini Talks. Take care. <laughs>